Hi, everybody. Welcome to the QB School. I'm JT O'Sullivan. Today, we're going over NFL game plans. Those huge cards you see offensive coordinators, head coaches holding over their mouths, top secret stuff. We're going to dive into it, see exactly how they construct it. We're going to talk about coordinator, head coach, quarterback, relationship. We're going to be talking about how to create new plays. How did they actually do it? Building plays from the base up. This will be a really informative, exciting video. I'm excited. Thanks for being here. Let's dive into it. Welcome to the QB School. Okay, first question. Wesley, can you show how a game plan is put together by opponents' tendencies, matchups, and maybe how many formations and plays for it would there be in there? So, yeah, we can get into it. I actually went through my old books, and I actually don't have that many of them. And so it's going to be kind of a internet kind of put together thrown thing here. But I think you're going to ex be excited to learn that it's really not that crazy. And so what I mean by that is... It depends on the team that you're in. Normally, what you which what will happen is that you will get kind of base runs and base passes, and that's really just normal down and distance. And what I mean by that is first and ten, second and medium, second and short, maybe some second and long, second and after a penalty, first and after a penalty, kind of your base runs, base passes that you're going to do out of your normal personnel groups. Then really the situational football of it is third downs, third downs, red zone. So you're going to usually have teams broken down by third down and short, third down and medium, third down and long. And really that's kind of the differences on teams, how they break down the third down yardages, because that will then determine how they scout and what the tendencies are on your opponent. And then in the red zone, it's usually from the 20 to the 10 or 20 to the 15 and break it into fourths or break it into thirds or break it into halves and then kind of tight red zone at the goal line. Goal line short yard is usually different personnel. So let's look at an image here. We got Kyle Shanahan. So this is the thumbnail for this video. And really, this just exactly kind of reinforces what we're going over here. Pass game, normal pass game, normal run game. You see all sorts of different formations here. Now, I apologize for being a little small, depending on what device you're working on here. But again, you can see that there's a handful of probably 150, 200 plays here. So normal down and distance, run game, pass game. Then here's that third down I was talking about. Third down, now they break it up 2 to 7, 8 to 11, and 12 plus. So I've seen it any different ways. Usually it's some variation of thirds. And then, of course, you don't have the third and short, short yardage situation. So really this is fourths. So third and short, third and medium long, third and real long. Now we're over into the red zone. Again, the red area, 20 to the 10, 9 to the goal line. And then inside that one, you get that goal line situation. Then also you got some just base throws that they want to do. Tiger, base is a personnel group probably in their offense. Tiger is definitely a personnel group in that West Coast offense. But again, you can see how it's constructed. It's by the opponent, normal base run game, probably some screen game, normal pass game. But again, if you depending on the device you're on here, let's just break down the pass game. So base passes. So again, this is by personnel. Tiger Gator passes, base passes. And so from there, it's three-step stuff, five to seven-step stuff, seven-man protection stuff, meaning we're going to block it up, play pass stuff, meaning play action, movement stuff, like nakeds, we're going to move the quarterback, move the launch point, and then different variations of screens. And that's really how it's broken down in just about every level of football. Now, depending on the level of football you're at, you're probably not going to have this many passes or this many of just kind of situational football options because you don't want to get stuck practicing things you're never going to rep. Again, this is a high volume, I would say, play card, but not out of the ordinary. I think it's a normal kind of view, kind of encapsulates kind of the volume that most teams carry going into a week. But again, Kyle Shanahan, one of the better play callers in the league for a long time now, is able to trick and smokescreen people, especially in the run game. They do great stuff everywhere he's been. But again, this that kind of thumbnail, the image, just gives you a kind of the encapsulation of what it actually looks like. And then really, it, I don't think it's that complicated. I think it's kind of structured pretty uh, intuitively. Base runs, base passes, situational football, third down, red zone. Then on the back, you'll probably have some specialty stuff. Uh, clock management stuff, kind of two-minute stuff, empty stuff, stuff you'll get into if you're in a zero game. So kind of cover all your bases, have the referees' names on there, those sorts of little things that every play call has. But if you just want to get to the kind of bare bones, exactly what it is, you're going to have your 
base runs, base passes, and that's first and second down, normal down and distance stuff. Then you're going to have third down calls, maybe some fourth down calls. You're going to have some red area calls, maybe some high red zone stuff that you like to take shots into the end zone. And that's really it. That's the play call sheet. I think that it, I think that it looks more complicated than it is. All these code words. What are they going to say? You know, could I know every single word on that play sheet? No. But if you give me a little bit of time to learn the concepts, they're probably pretty familiar. I know the vast majority of the core concepts just because there's some variation of West Coast and all those things kind of bleed together at some level. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have any other questions about the uh, how the game plan is constructed, please leave them in the video. I appreciate it. Next question. All right, from Jeremy. If you were an offensive coordinator in today's NFL, what would your bread and butter passing concepts be? That's a good question, Jeremy. I'm not sure <laughs> that I would ever be a coordinator in the NFL, but I think it's hard to answer, to be honest with you, too. I mean, it would depend. And I, I hope, I think that honestly, that's what most coaches and coordinators or players would want coaches to say. And what I mean by that is I'm not trying to be aloof. I'm really trying to say it depends on what our players can do. It depends on what the players can do. It depends on what the quarterback's feeling comfortable with. I think that there are some core concepts that I felt comfortable with as a player that I think are pretty comfortable to most players. But then again, I'm not going to force feed that type of stuff onto someone. I think what it totally depends on what type of players you have. I think that there are so many offensive advantages in today's game that if you don't take advantage of them, it's kind of your own bad. And what I mean by that is RPO stuff. So RPOs are just simple ways to really put a threat on a lot of defenses in a lot of different ways, both horizontally, vertically, in the run game, in the pass game, in the run fits, in the pass coverage, all of those things that it's really important to try to find ways to take advantage of that. But I've also been around a number of coaches, uh, players, officials even, that call them RPGs, run pass guesses. And so you know, do I think that they can be coached and taught? Yes. Do I think everyone can run them? No. And so I don't want to force feed that into a quarterback that, you know, has never been asked to do it or doesn't have the capacity to do it. And so it's about bleeding together all the concepts that you like as a coordinator, play caller, kind of football X's and O's thing with also what are your players comfortable doing? Not only what are they comfortable doing, what are they really good at? And I think that's one of the things that I've always admired about the Patriots. The Patriots are so good at about not only adapting on the sideline in game, but they only ask their players to do the things that they're really good at. Now, usually many of them are good at doing multiple things and that's why they're there. But it's about, for me, it's always about trying to get the players to do what they're really good at as often as we can and make it look really complicated, but really have it be a simple system that's easily understood. People can come in and contribute really fast, but also be able to be something that's difficult to prepare for. You don't want to just go out there and have everybody in the stadium knowing exactly what you're going to be doing. So it's some sort of combination of all of those things. It's never not going to be like, hey, if I was in today's NFL, I'd just come out and bang sl slants all day. Like, no. Like, if we had a great slant runner. Yes. We'd love to find matchups to be able to do that. But if we've got somebody who's really quick in and out of the breaks, like maybe we should do some option routes. If we've got a great tailback who can catch the ball, maybe we do a lot of screens or find ways to get them lined up as a wide receiver to throw them the ball. So those type of matchups, you just have to be creative. It's not just about one thing. It's not about the coach's system. It's about blending what the players do really well with what you can actually get done in a week and practice and feel good about going out there to run. And so it doesn't change what level you're at, whether it's Pop Warner, Flag, the, or the league. You want to feel confident with what, you, what you're doing. You want to feel like you can go out there and do it, be successful, and do it when it matters in crunch time and kind of have the reps to have that foundation built to say like, oh, we can be really successful running this. So great question. Appreciate it. Next question, Golden Rumble. Hi, JT. I have to say I love your content. I found your channel, watched a third of your videos, and signed up for Patreon all on the space of a weekend. Now, that is what I like to hear. I'm just wondering when writers and talking heads on TV might say something along the lines of, this quarterback doesn't get X coaches system. What does that mean? What really makes the difference between head coaches, offense coordinators, and defense coordinators? That's a great question, and I'm not sure you know this little short video is going to give you the kind of answer and in-depth kind of meaningful take that I think that question probably deserves. I will say when talking heads or anybody says, you know, like this quarterback doesn't fit this system to me, you know, those are just kind of excuses. I think that there's an element of coaching and an element of playing that you have to be adaptive. You have to try to understand what the coach wants to do with the ball, what the philosophical agenda of the system that you're in is asking you to do. But then the coach's responsibility is to put their players in successful situations and systems. So it's not about 
circle, square, peg. It's about blending those things together, finding out what the most efficient shape that that organization can run, and then being really good at it and, and doing the best things that they can with the best players that they can in that moment and going from week to week. So when they say like, you know, Baker doesn't fit Freddie's system anymore, stuff like that to me is like, you know, I, that just sounds like a, an empty kind of lazy response, in my opinion. I think that most people, especially at the highest level, are pretty adaptive in what they can and can't do. Now, I've been around people that certainly aren't, but for the vast majority, they want the players to be successful and the players want the coaches to be successful because they know the jobs are intertwined and mixed together and really clung together. Really, you're kind of tethered, especially if you're the quarterback to your head coach, to your coordinator, you want them to be successful just as much as they want you to be successful. So it works. It makes sense that you would want to work together to know what that means. I think oftentimes what makes the really great head coaches and offense coordinators and defense coordinators have those relationships with their quarterback specifically is just the time that they spend together. You get a chance to hear the coach talk and talk more. And then, you know, the fifth time that they say something, it really resonates. And now it's seared into your brain as opposed to the first four times they said it. They said it. You just didn't hear it. Or you just were off in la-la land in a meeting or not paying attention or it didn't register. And so whether you need to get the on-field rep, the film rep, standing behind the play rep, all of those things to kind of be able to better understand what that coach is asking you to do. And then coaches get better too over the course of coaching. And so they get a better way to teach, evaluate, educate, all of those things to better communicate what the intent of what they're trying to do is. And I always appreciated uh, quarterback coaches, play callers, coaches telling me like what the intent of the play is. Like, hey, we're taking a shot down the field. If you get the matchup you want, we want you to throw it, feel confident and throw it to the matchup we like. If you don't, we want you to check it down. Be smart with the ball, not force it. Or if we're talking about fourth downs, like, hey, push the ball down the field, force it. We don't, there's nothing to hold back from. This is situational football. You know, those type of things that aren't really always communicated. Or, hey, if we're in the red zone, we know we have points. You cannot take a sack. If we're in the high red zone, you cannot take a sack. Now, if we're on the third and 10, if we're on the 10 yard line and it's third and eight, be really careful with the ball because we have three points, but you can still take a sack if you want to hang tight, especially in the league. Those are gimme field goals. But if you're at high school or Pop Warner, those 10 yards on a sack are huge. We can't take a sack. So that type of communication, I think that to me is more important than like, hey, you know, Billy Bob doesn't fit Jimmy Joe's system. Like nobody cares. Like those systems are, you know, unless you're in the option or veer and, you know, you're not a running quarterback, like just about everybody can make every type of throw. Yes. Are some people a little bit better at anticipating, throwing with rhythm? Yeah. Are some people better see it, throw it, let it rip, just cannon up an arm? Yeah, but it's also called coaching. Like you have to coach them, coach them up on how you want them. If we're going to be more of a rhythm passing offense, well, then you need to get quarterbacks who can anticipate and make throws that aren't there and throw people open. Or do you just have a guy who has a monster of a cannon, has always had a monster of a cannon, never had to anticipate in his life? Well, then coaching him is going to be more of a challenge. But is it impossible? No, it's called coaching. You have to teach and educate and help help your players get better. And I think that's what the best coaches do. And I think that's what those best relationships between quarterbacks and whatever their coach is, it's kind of they mutually elevate each other. So they challenge each other. They make both, they make each other better, but you can't be static. You can't be, oh, I'm afraid to tell, you know, Aaron Rodgers, like, hey, bro, you're throwing off your back foot. It's pretty, it's causing you to be a little inconsistent. Or like, yeah, he's a Hall of Famer 15 years. He probably knows that, but he still wants to be coached really hard. And that doesn't change at whatever level you're at. You have a star player. They probably want to be coached really hard. That's probably why they're star players. And so it's that relationship about building trust, but also providing value. Like the, the coaches want their players to play at a high level. The players want to be coached at a high level. I think I always think of Popovich always saying that in hoops. Like the best players want to be coached. And I think that translates across all sports. And it's kind of a, a nice way to not allow that excuse of saying like, oh, he doesn't fit X, Y system. Like, no, like the coaches want the best players. The players want the best coaches. And together they're going to find whatever's best for that organization, that team. Next question, Jonathan Dennis. Hey, JT, new to the channel, Patreon, but I'm loving what you're doing and learning a lot. Two ideas for you. Would you be open to doing a two-minute drill segment? Yes, absolutely. It's a great idea. Would it be possible to go into detail on what goes into designing plays from the bottom up? How often are new route combinations and concepts created? So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the number two. New concepts and new pass plays, depending on what level you're at, are created all the time. 
but really they're not created from scratch. Most often you're going to just combine things that you already do. And so, so you're going to run a play either maybe out of a different personnel group, maybe out of a different formation, maybe with a different shift, with a different motion. You're going to dress it up. So you always want to be running your core concepts, but you want to make it look different. You don't want to give any clues to the defense if we're talking about offensive football here. From there, I think you do you do create new passing concepts pretty often. To me, I never like to just insert five new routes or be around offenses that create these whole new pictures or new concepts. What I like to do is marry route combinations together in different unique ways. So maybe one side of the field is a smash concept and the other side of the field is a slant man beater concept. Or maybe there's a yeah a zone beater on one side, a man beater on the other side. So what I mean by that is you got an option, an opportunity to run like an option route, or you have a pick play on the other side. And so the quarterback has to be able to determine is it man or zone, and then that determines where they go with the with the ball. And so it's never looking the same to the defense because the defense is dictating what they're doing. That's why it's always that's why it's so hard to play defense. The offense knows exactly where they're going. The defense has to adjust and react. But that's the thing that I like to do. I personally like to have as many all-purpose plays as possible. What I mean by that is they're good versus any coverage. So you line up any coverage, middle field open, man, middle field open zone, middle field close, man or zone, cover zero. We have answers to everything. Now you have to have quarterbacks and players who can see it and adjust, but that's part of coaching. You got to coach them up. I don't like to go out there and say, this is a great man beater play. Unless you're, you know, Column plays at the line of scrimmage where you can see exactly what the defense is in and you know for sure, it's pretty hard to play football that way. I think most times I love play callers, systems that create all-purpose menus. And what I mean by that is if it's man, we know where to go with the ball. If it's zone, we know where to go with the ball. If it's man or zone, we might have different options. What wide receivers can do. Do they keep running? Do they settle? Do they run through zones? Do they set picks? You know, what are the different options versus man and zone? Then you have to rep all those looks, obviously. And the quarterback has to be able to see it, identify it, and then, of course, make the throws. But to me, very rarely is it like, okay, new formation, new personnel group, new concept, new protection, almost never, to be honest with you. Occasionally, you'll get new stuff. I think it's a little bit more, uh, it happens more often in maybe the screen game because it's a little bit easier to insert brand new screens. Next question, Lewis, JT, best football site. Question, what are QBs checking down audibly on the line of scrimmage? I know they can change the play, but can they stick with a play and just change part of it? Why? So, Lewis, great question. And again, no easy answer. It depends on the offense that you're in. Most offenses allow quarterbacks to make certain changes at the line of scrimmage. Not all the time, though. Really, not all the time. Now, if you're in an offense that allows you to change the play all the time, you have a coach that is very trusting. Most coaches have specific checks versus specific looks. And so there, yes, they absolutely depend on you to change the play and really kind of save the team, protect the play, protect the ball, all those things. Get your offense into the best play is kind of the way that it's normally understood. I think the thing that you're thinking is when they can change some element of it, how do they do it? I think it depends, again, on the offense. The easiest way, kind of the easiest answer for me is in the pass game or in kind of the RPO game where you have a specific wide receiver that you're trying to get the ball to as kind of a first read, depending on the look, you'll often see quarterbacks give signals. So I've seen different signals from tapping their bottom, tapping their head, hitting their neck, waving, uh, anything you can think of to be kind of a subtle signal, a little circle, anything that kind of the defense doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to, but the wide receiver and quarterback kind of make eye contact and know to be on the same page. That's kind of the most obvious way that quarterbacks are able to change one part of the play without changing the whole overarching, you know, pass protection, formation, motion, shift, all those things are much more rare. I think just the simple, subtle signal to one side of the field, even to multiple receivers or to just one wide receiver, like, hey, let's go a back shoulder here or let's get a go route if they're pressed on you or something like take the out, take the hitch. Anything like that is kind of the most obvious, simplest way to change one play. But again, even then, I've been around many coaches who will not let you do that until you've earned a whole huge high level of trust. Then again, I've been around systems where it's required of the quarterback to get the wide receiver into the best concept. And I've even been around systems where the wide receiver can suggest routes to the quarterback. So you see them do little signals based on what the leverage is of the DB. So all of those things, it really just depends on the system that you're at and what the coordinator coaches want to do to take best advantage of what how they want to attack a defense. But absolutely great question. Thank you for it.
All right, that's a wrap on this one. Hopefully you learned something, enjoyed the uh, NFL kind of game plan, how it's constructed, what it looks like, how do the people come up with new concepts, new plays, all those things, how they fit together, what's the relationship look like between the play caller and a system and a quarterback, all those things. So let me know what you think about the video. If you haven't already, please subscribe. I appreciate the support so much. Fun to see this thing grow. I will see you next time. Thanks for coming to the QB School.